you guys. Um, Thank you. Probably makes more sense because it's okay. on my WebEx. I don't know why I was telling you that. It says it's in progress. We now have a system in place. <laughs> All right, Dwight, I'll turn things over to you. Um, uh, and I'm going to mute myself because my office is not very quiet. So. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and thank you everyone for attending. I have the honor of introducing Dr. Abdel Halim for the second time now. Um, we did a brown bag. Boy, it's been a couple of years now, I guess, but it was an excellent brown bag before. And so I'm very much looking forward to this day. So, yes, it's an honor to me to be able to introduce Dr. Abdel Halim, who is a professor in the Department of Women and Gender Studies here at UT. This is a, a very productive and highly esteemed department and a very productive and highly esteemed professor in that department. Her PhD comes from Ohio University. And since getting her degree, Dr. Halim, Dr. Abdel Halim has not just been a researcher, but also an activist for human rights. And more specifically, her research and her activism focuses on women's rights, Muslims, women's rights in Africa, other parts of the world as well. She has a long list of publications, but perhaps best known for her book, Sudanese Women in the United States, The Double Problem of Gender and Culture. And again, I'm very excited about this presentation and looking forward to learning more I, I, I'll add one last thing very quickly and then I'll turn it over. I think with Sudan, oftentimes when we talk about this area of the world here in the US, we only hear about it when there's a conflict or a natural disaster. And what I like about Dr. Abdel Halim's work is she doesn't just see an area as a conflict zone. She doesn't just see people as victims of a natural disaster. She sees them as humanity and she understands their agency and the importance of their daily lives in ways that we just don't come to appreciate from a news headline. So without further ado, I wanna turn it over to Dr. Abdel Halim. I'm gonna mute myself as well, but we'll open, I'll come back when it's time for Q&A. Uh, Dr. Abdel Halim, thank you. Um, thank you so much for your generous introduction. And I, I will start with, uh, with a little historical um, background to uh, this. So I was, you know, I have a passionate research to find out certain things about hypotheses that we have been having since colonization and after and post colonization uh, is that women have been left behind. So there has got to be a good reason for that. It turned out, you know, all the things that we thought about is how women were doing their part, but no one was paying attention. So the traditions and the laws and uh, uh, part of it was made up religious um, uh, things. There was an upheaval, of course, where women also uh, participated and that upheaval was sending the colonizer home. But the uh, whatever history has written about that left women out, left what women has done or had done in, in that out. Then came the post-colonial nationalist governments and the nationalists were, hey, woman, calm down. We have more important issues to do. So why don't you just sit there and wait for us to solve some problems and then we will look into your problems. Of course, that happened all over the world after uh, colonization from India to Africa. So I started publishing papers on this, and then I decided to take it into the book. And I was having a good time talking about the Candakes, which was the queen, the, when the Sudan was a matriarchal and a matrilineal society. And the Candix, and I think they say, uh, uh, some Africanists would say Candice, the name Candice came from Candic. So the Candix were the real rulers. They led their armies, they fought for uh, their kingdoms, everything. I was having a good time doing that and then getting part of the research that I have done. But suddenly, all that took a tear. And the turn happened because of two upheavals in the Sudan. 
The first upheaval were demonstrations all over the country, but specifically in the capital, tri-city capital of the Sudan. And the second one was the COVID-19. So people had to fight on both sides. Everyone was saying, well, don't go out on these demonstrations because there is COVID-19. But no one was listening to that. And I think it was um, a little bit um, better. There, there weren't that many incidents of uh, COVID-19 and, and deaths start, just started to, to happen uh, because the demonstrations were in open air in on the streets. But then the government, of course, started to shoot people, to mistreat women. Uh, to tell women that they are prostitutes if they go on the street, but no one was listening. Unlike any other time, the youth and the women were out there. They were doing everything to just show the government that we are sick and tired of 30 years of dictatorship. So people went on doing that. In the meantime, the skirmishes were a little bit not that bad, like uh, as they were in Egypt. So in 2014, I applied to go to Egypt to do my research because there are some historical documents there that are found in Egypt because they were uh, partners of the British and in, in, uh, during the colonization of the Sudan. But then before I signed the contract, they told me, well, sorry, Egypt is not a safe place. The uh, embassy of the United States said no people Fulbright or no Fulbright should come. So I sat on my research for like four years and I applied again, 2017. Results were, came out in 2018 and I went all through up until I signed the contract. I was supposed to travel to Chicago and meet a Sudanist who was going to orient me with the Sudan. So I think that happens because of the mechanical way we do things. I knew about the Sudan. I was born there, grew up there. So I know about the Sudan more than my, he happened to be also my advisor. He is a Sudanist and he was my advisor for uh, my PhD. We just had a laugh about that, who is going to orient who with the Sudan. But then suddenly also the embassy in Khartoum said, well, no, even the Fulbrights who are here are going to be sent back because the demonstrations started in the Sudan. By 2018, December 2018, everything fell apart. And I was not able to go there on a full bride. My uh, contract has been withdrawn and sorry, why don't you apply next year? So I figured, no, I will just go by myself. I usually go to Sudan every uh, uh, year during the summer or during the winter for the winter break. And I started to do my research. I collected some um, uh, good, uh, information, some of the progress that women have made. It never occurred to me that women were going to lead the demonstration. We're going to be up there for, to, to do uh, such a, a huge demonstration. Okay. And, and, I, and I took it easy for a while, but then my sister used to work for one NGO, and she said, I should start uh, recording because they are not going to be open for long. This is taking, um, uh, uh, the pace is taking up, and women are there uh, uh, for that. And, and then it turned into a rest of women. Okay, let us, let us do a scare thing. Scare the women by going into those organizations, arrest them, bring them to the police station, uh, give them some harsh words, call them names, and they will back off. But that did not happen. 
So I had to be there to follow this. I had to be there to actually see what is going on. Because by that time, the, 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 in 2019, April 2019, and then June, the government fell. They were uh, out. The bad thing is that another military took over. They were just racing with the civilians. And then people started to talk about the civil government. Even children in the street, I just got something on my phone in a, a third grade class. A military man came in, in his fatigue, uh, to pick up his son. But then all the second graders just surrounded him and started to shout, Madania, Madania, which means civilian, civilian, civilian. Everywhere they see that, they just start chanting civilian, civilian, civilian. But they didn't know, of course, what civilian is, but they knew that this is something that was wanted uh, by, uh, by the people. But let me see if I can get this. This was yesterday. I have no sound if this is in English, Dr. Abdelhalim. You have no sound? I can hear you, but I can't hear the video. Oh. Gosh. Can you just tell us what they're talking about? Oh, the demonstration is getting bigger. This was yesterday. So this is one of the uh, this is one of the reasons that the NGO said we will stop, you know, this research thing, because they shot ten people, so more people came out. Twenty more came out until we reached seventy. Yesterday we reached eighty, and people are still coming in droves. Are they are not the usual youth? If you see this guy here, he's over 60 and he also talked to the demonstrators. You will see two types of um, uh, two flags. The first flag was after independence, which put us with uh, the African countries. And then the dictatorship decided that why don't we mix a new flag? that would add us, because we are members to the Arab League, would add us to the uh, flags of the Arab nations and the African nations. So now people are, you know, whatever flag you find about the Sudan, you will just um, raise it. And the reporter is talking about how this is picking up and how hundreds of thousands of people are on the streets. So yesterday, there were about five shootings, which made it to 80 people. Today, some of the people who are in ho being hospitalized, and by the way, they prevented people from getting into the hospitals. Sometimes they would attack the hospital itself and throw tear gas there so that the doctors cannot do their work. Um, uh, the day before yesterday, in a hospital near uh, where my family lives, they arrested six people from Doctors Without Borders, Medicine San Frontiers. So they took them and they took them to an unknown place. So people in this demonstration yesterday was trying to find out where they took the people also. 
So it is getting, it is getting from bad to worse to worst, but the people are not backing off. And then of course there is the interference or intervention by by uh, United States, European Union, um, all that, and it is not it is not doing well because they seem to be deaf to what the street wants. Okay, so in that case, by the time I was I was there until uh, August of last year, but I could not do the research not because of this demonstration, because that was a calm during the uh, civil government. But then the military started to push out the civilians until finally the prime minister was uh, sent home, but then they brought him back and they tried to form a civilian government and now they can't because no one wants to work with um, uh, a military. Uh, government. But even during that time, everyone was looking at what are we going to do now? All the meetings I went to were meetings about what is next, which of course completely turned my research into what is going on. Now I can't talk about the candex of the Nubian I can't tell, talk of the, the, the women uh, who led their own armies. Now I have to talk, about, to talk about women today. Now I have to document what is going on and my research should take that turn. Whatever I have done, whatever 50 pages, 90 pages I wrote before, then that has to go. Because it doesn't make sense to see people leading but at the same time, you're talking about the past. That could be done later. The past is there, it's staying. It's not going anywhere. But women here are going somewhere, okay? I am going to try to find... This is a famous picture. Was she famous before this at all? The student? So I don't know how to get the sound back here. You still can't hear it? We can't hear it, but we can read the subtitles. Oh, okay. Was this student so famous this, before this? This is actually shooting is taking place. So while this is there, this woman is on top of a car. So she got there and you see so many women in that demonstrations have been um, around her. This is unprecedented. And, and I think the only country that um, uh, recognized women's role there uh, in, in these demonstrations 
um, is France, because when they invited the Minister of Finance, they invited this woman and another woman who was who became famous for being the uh, the tear gas catcher. She's a good catcher. She would catch the canister and send it back into the uh, whoever they are, because everyone is denying that they are uh, uh, doing things in these uh, demonstrations. But she sent it to the police or the military who were there. Uh, and there are other two women. Now they have in jail for the past three days um, a disabled woman who is heading uh, a virtual organization cause, uh, called No to the Oppression of Women. Uh, she was in good health until a wall uh, fell on her and hurt her uh, back. And she is walking on uh, two sticks. They sent there about 20 people, 20 military people with Kalashnikovs. They didn't knock on the door. They just pushed the door down. They went in there. And uh, only her sister was just telling them she is taking a shower. She just have to wait for her. And they were like, no, no, we won't wait. And then I think some of them were like, no, we are not going to do this and kept each other back until she got out. And then they arrested her and took her somewhere. She is a very courageous woman. She has been arrested several times before, but this time it is different. This time, because they are trying to target women, and then they started a rape spree. And there is also um, a demonstration uh, by women. So they said, we are going to go out all as women. Some men joined, but they remained around the women. And about 50,000 women went out there uh, chanting, military should go to the barracks because girls are taking over the streets. And they did take over the street. And of course, everyone shied away from shooting the women. So they just let it go. And they demonstrated for like six hours around the streets of the three cities, around the streets of other cities, other than the, uh, the capital cities, fortunately with no casualties. In, 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 uh, in that. But then it became clear that Sudanese women now, what they are doing now is what needs to be recorded, is what needs to be written about. Okay. And this is where I'm taking my research now. I'm ditching whatever I did before and I'm starting to do this. And this is how the two upheavals have affected my research. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abdel Halim. Usually as, uh, as the moderator, I take the advantage of asking the first question, but today I'm not going to do that. Um, Dr. Barnes had a quick question. I was wondering too, the student that we see on the car she was not famous before this, was she? Well, um, she is not a student. No, she was not famous at all. She just, she just belongs to a famous family. And not famous for being rich, but famous for being uh, serving, serving the uh, Sudan for a long time. But when she was there, no one knew who was she. Excellent, thank you. I do have a couple questions, but before I ask anybody else, I'll, I'll open it up to other people first. Yes, yeah, Sharon, go ahead. I wanted to ask, I, I know that you had done some, uh, is it Can Dake, the, the, the Queens, the warrior Queens and the Nubian leaders? I know you had done some research in that direction already. Do you think that the, there's any relationship between the heritage of these um, powerful women uh, taking political control and the willingness of young women today to um, do the same thing, really. 
you think there's any way you can use that research uh, as 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 foundation to where you're headed now, basically? I think so because the first thing that happened after you know women became visible there, the first thing that the demonstrators did was link them to the candidates. So now every Sudanese woman is called a candidate. Uh, many and, and it has um, an Arabic plural, so the kandakat. The kandakat is a uh, is a plural for candidate. And every reference to them, they are not referring to them that like the Sudanese women. They are referred to them as the candidates. And they were hoping, actually, their big hope that and people are openly talking about this. You have to have a government that a majority of your government should be women. Because the women who were uh, chosen by the first civilian government in 2019 were very quickly attacked. There is, there is some sort of sexism there, especially for women governors. So governors of the states, there were like three governors of the states, two of them survived until the second military coup in October of last year, uh, when they were dismissed. But they survived the sexism and they convinced everyone that they are actually doing their job. So it stopped. All that sexism had continued for a month again. It's them and, and some poets came up with poetry telling no woman can rule us. We are men. We have to have yeah, all that now is gone. So I think uh, this is also thanks for reminding me of that. This is also a strain that has to be followed. How why people are dropping their men are dropping that sexism this fast thank you I ha can i jump in Dwight? i have a question um well it's actually it's, it's sort of two questions so um one is if you could summarize um where what the asks are of the protesters right now like what are the top five priorities that they're asking for when they're on the ground. Um, and if there's a difference between different constituents, like are um, young women asking for something different than um, other leaders? And then the other question I have is a little bit more of like a, a nerdy question, which is that how has, um, how did like, you have a different set of research skills for the first project, right? So you are going to go to Egypt and look at papers, right? So you're going to do archival research, and now you you're switching gears, and like any great interdisciplinary scholar, you have another set of research skills that you're using for this research. So I'm kind of wondering, um, what research skills are you pulling on? How are you um, able to transition so well between projects, and sort of how might they? research-wise sort of feed each other in terms of your skill set and how you know how to do what you do. Uh, um, thank you. Uh, you remind me of your first question. If you could summarize like what the asks are of the protesters. So are the, and are there different the, groups? The main, the main thing the protesters are for now is a civilian government with no presence of the military because the military say well we will be the sovereign council and you can have you know civilian um, uh, government that's a no and i'm sorry to say that the 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 americans who intervened just turned the you know a deaf ear to this they kept saying well let us calm this down let us uh, not um, you know make it like uh, the civil wars in libya and syria and and the best thing i heard from those young people is that hey we are not doing this for other generations all the generations and we are not doing it to appease any european union or americas or the united nations this is for us and we are going to do it no matter what you say. So every time they are killed, there are more coming out uh, for that. This is the number one thing. Number two, 
No one is going to push women around. That 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 has to be you know known to to everyone. Number three, there is an unprecedented inflation in the country, and everyone knows where it is coming from. It's coming from Egypt because all the uh, counterfeit of uh, the uh, uh, Sudanese currency is coming from Egypt. And they are saying, hey, they are telling the, the government, the military government, we are going to buy the cotton, gum Arabic, sesame, everything that you produce with Sudanese currency. Okay, tell us where would you get Sudanese currency in Egypt? Why would any Egyptian want a useless currency there? So everything is now what is happening is that people in northern Sudan have closed the road that gets uh, uh, trucks to Egypt. So no trucks are in Egypt now. And the Egyptians are uh, starting to threaten. So the more they threaten, the more the movement gets stronger. So these are four things that people are talking about and just give us the civilian government and, and, and then we know what to do. Uh, for the research, I have been joining every a virtual meeting. I, I just, um, uh, uh, you know, was the, uh, was the, the, uh, a presenter on human rights brought by the Sudanese professors in the United States. And I introduced him and I sat there through the meeting. I am with all the virtual meetings held by women, except for anything that is held by the Islamists or by the uh, uh, women who served in the dictatorship. I don't go to those, but I think that's a mistake. We should know what they are doing. We should have first-hand knowledge of what these people are doing. So with the women, I'm in more than one um, uh, virtual groups. And then I attend every virtual presentation by Sudanese intellectuals anywhere. They are taking turns in America in the United Kingdom, in Egypt, everywhere they're holding these meetings with people who have an idea about what, go, what is going on. Because the people who are ruling now have no idea other than to kill people. They are militias. We have someone who have been entered as a general and he, he didn't finish even fourth grade. He's from the, the Arab uh, groups in Darfur. And the best kept secret in the Sudan is that the real Arabs are not us who live in the center. They are in northern Darfur and northern Kordofan, the western, because they came down from West Africa into uh, the Sudan. So he is collecting any Arab he could find in Chad, in Niger, in Nigeria, anywhere. And he made a huge military component. So now with no credentials at all, he is second in the government of Sudan. His troops are the ones who are killing the people. Now, and now people are in some sort of fear, not of going to the demonstration, but of being found somewhere, beaten by some of these people and their phones are taken away because there is a huge market for stolen cell phones in Chad and in Niger and in these countries. So people are losing some of the most expensive uh, uh, property and they could go, they can push the door in any house and go in for that. But then the women are also Playing, this is one of the things that women uh, play during the heavy demonstrations. They would make the sandwiches, juice, everything, put it on a truck, one of those Toyota trucks, 
dive it over to the demonstration where they give, you know, give people food, give those young people food and water, juice, whatever uh, they need. They also stand guard. One of the things that maybe we should be thankful for an old tradition is that a man would not touch a woman. You will not beat up a woman. You will not mistreat her. But this is something to change because women have been standing there as like, no, you are not going into this house. One of those people would just go mad and go in there and beat up a woman or beat up whoever in the house. But they are still keeping this role of just taking advantage, just like the demonstrations by the women against rape, no one dared to shoot the women or to even throw a can of tear gas. It is not manly, you know, it's not manly to do that. So women take an advantage of this also. Just to follow up on that really quick, do you think that you might have an opportunity to interview some of the women who are emerging as leaders at some point? Will you, do you, is it possible? Yes, I think it is possible. Uh, in June, I'm going back to the Sudan. And I know, I know many of them. I know many of them, of, uh, of the leaders and who are now organizing, and I'm in a group the uh, a WhatsApp group that for, with those women. So I'm I'm definitely going to find them. Jean, if I may, Janine Diller had a question. Hi, um, thank you so much. This is fascinating, and you were starting to touch on my question, which was just about um, gender roles. I guess like how how they're using um, their gender identity to, to protest. And it sounds like, if I heard you right, there's sort of a, a double uh, role there that men, some men don't want to fight against them, which gives them the freedom to, to come into the streets in a way that men might not have, um, but other men still do fight at them. So I was just interesting to hear more about that, whether there's sort of a, changing sense of the, the norms on the ground about how to treat women. Um, but I also wondered if there's um, sort of a cohesive force that, you know, I'm a woman, you're a woman, we both think this about the government. Like, are, are they kind of using their gender identity as a, as a, yeah, cohesion to get the movement started on the ground? And are there other things I'm not even thinking of that are playing a role gender-wise in the way the, the fight is, is playing out? Thank you. Well, they definitely are using that. And at the beginning of demonstrations, uh, there would be women in the demonstration, but only one, only two women were shot and a child. The child is a sixth grader who recited a poem that has a political content. She was shot inside her home. Inside the house, someone was able to shoot this little girl in the head. The other two were shot in the demonstrators. And this is where at the beginning, men would surround the women because it is not nice to expose the women to such treatment. But then they found out that women are fierce and they just do anything. So they are not doing that anymore. And women were, especially older women, like there are women my age, women who are younger, and, and then all the university students, and they will say, well, no, you, that, that is not your job, to protect anyone in a demonstration. We are all in the demonstration together, and we can't have you shot and not us, but it's still, um, they would shoot a woman that they actually, and, and it is done by snipers, and it became apparent that the snipers are targeting 
two types of people, the leaders of the youth leaders, and then any one with, uh, with a big hair, like the Rastafari hairs. Many of those shot, you, you, you look at the pictures and they all had this, you know, long, big head, hair and on their head. There is something against them. So this is one of the observations made. And then it's also, yeah, there is someone there who is not, you know, brought up well because he's shooting women. So women now are like, yeah, we will do what we want to do. And you don't have to do to provide the, pro the, 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 the protection. So in the first, uh, the, and the, the video that was taken uh, yesterday, you can see the women just, you know, mingling with everyone. They are not in the middle. They are not being protected, anything like that. Uh, Dr. Day first and then Dr. Barnes. Uh -huh, Barnes, I get to go first. Uh, I'm I'm sort of wondering um, what routes you can see right now to um, success for the demonstrators. Like, is there a path forward that you see that is maybe more likely than other paths? And like, sort of like, can you predict um, how they might be successful? I don't know. I, I think the only way they are going to be successful is insisting which they are doing. It's like, yeah, you can with 80 of them and, and people and, and, and those uh, young men who were interviewed, they said, yeah, I'm willing to die. To the extent that a couple of them came with their shrouds with them. They carry your shroud on your back. You're going to die. So this is the this is the thing that the government doesn't know what to do with. Shall we go ahead and kill more? Or are there because there is an insistence is that the more you kill, the more people are coming out to do this. So and now they are in a very bad situation because even the people who were with the the second military coup that took place in October 25th uh, last year do not want to be members of the government. The military, the, the, the official military of the Sudan, they don't want to be part of the government. So what they did was they wanted something to be passed by the ministers. They said every undersecretary, because they gave it to the undersecretaries, now they should run the business and the ministries. So they said every undersecretary is going to be appointed a minister. So about nine of those undersecretaries, and I think today there are 10 of them, resigned. But they said, no, we were civilians running the business. We are not going to work for a military corps. Now they are back to square one where they cannot form a government. They don't have a government. Except for a minister of finance who refuses to go away. He is one of the fighters of Darfur. And you would think that the fighters from the Darfur, the leaders of the fighters, because the fighters themselves want to go back to Darfur, but the leaders are not allowing them because the leaders want to stay in the capital of the Sudan and they don't want to go back to Darfur. Actually, some of them cannot go back to Darfur because they have committed atrocities there. So everything is going to, to have an end. Are you going to have this mediocrity going on? People today are, there is a United Nations mission known to the Sudan known as UNAMITS. And UNAMIDS now is having people demonstration around their building telling them to get out of the country. Because you came here because the United Nations sent you to do something with these people. Either tell them to go away or to help them form a government, but you're not doing it and you are turning a blind eye, a deaf ear to what we are saying, so please go home. And they, the answer is, uh, no, 
we were brought here by the government. Well, we don't have a government now. So it is going, I think there will be a lot of surprises in the coming, right? Because every time you think of it, uh, the next day you find something different. Dr. Barnes and then Dr. Shetty. Thank you. I was going to ask about um, the, who is in the dem who is among the demonstrators. I'm thinking about Egypt and the vote after uh, after the revolution there, when the Islamist government was voted in. Are 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 you thinking that there are Islamists who are also part of the demonstrations who are who are demonstrating for the civilian government or are they mostly on the side of the military at this point? Some of them are saying that they are demonstrating for the government. They are demonstrating for a civilian government, but no one believes them. And most of them have been, you know, uh, uh, prohibited from any uh, political action by the uh, constitutional document that was written after uh, after the government uh, was overthrown. There is a constitutional document that expressly stated that that party, the only party that was governing governing to the Sudan, is banned from politics. Other they say, well, we want to participate in this, and of course, no one is listening to them because um, how come people people have been kill, the government have been killing people in the Sudan for thirty years? You never said anything. You want to have a voice now? Well, you lost your what? No, the one. Sujata has a question. I do. And I want to say first how every time I listen to you, Asma, I learn something new. So thank you so much. Uh, so I think my question might be, a, uh, I thought Sharon was going to ask my question, but uh, it, it's very close. Uh, the composition of the demonstrators, are they, uh, so we know that there were young people, uh, but are they now across the age spectrum, across the uh, you know, elites as well as people we might not call elite. Is it a very broad-based um, resistance? And the second question is about your safety and the safety of other researchers when you go back to Sudan. So, two two questions. Um, okay, now it is broad-based because our university professors have issued a, a statement saying that it is unacceptable for us to be working while our students were being killed. And we call upon this government to just go away and deliver it to the civilians. Doctors are doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Teachers, teachers, a couple of teachers were killed in a, a demonstration by teachers. Fathers and mothers who were at the beginning thinking, ah, oh, well, they are out there again at it and it's not going to do anything. Now they are joining. So you have this mixture of ages now in there. And you have people. The last thing came from the judges and the lawyers. Lower, uh, uh, for like the first innocence uh, courts, they are not working now. Uh, the lawyers are not going to courts anymore. Okay, and they are joining in the demonstrations. So it is getting, you know, women, of course, are the most organized right now. As for safety, I, I can't guarantee anything. Like on our street, which is um, actually a very quiet uh, street, those people came and threw canisters of uh, tear gas into the homes and they burned uh, a, a water pump in our neighbor's house. So 
that no one can guarantee anything right now. So you just have to be there. Okay. Um, someone just said, um, a couple of days ago sent me my uh, my sister video why she was on the street with both arms going like that. I said they're going to target because they're targeting everyone. So what? And 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 this is what is actually I I'm liking about this. People would back off for thirty years after some shootings, after some arrests, they would back off. This time, no one is backing. No one is saying, well, no, they are killing more people. No, the more you kill, the more we are go out there. No one is backing off at all. But didn't? And, and, but you did say to your nephew to, to cut his hair shorter, didn't you? So he wouldn't be targeted? Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> This is son of uh, my, my nephew. He's not in the Sudan anymore, but we force him. He liked his hair. I heard, well, you're going to be targeted. And he, and he was tall. He is tall. So he could be seen. Any sniper could see him. And this is what is happening now. People who have, I, I heard one of, of the youth making a joke about this. He said, I spent a lot of time growing this hair. <laughs> and I'm going to lose it. So, well, better than losing your life. Asma, this is Ali again. I'm just wondering if um, there's a way folks on the ground are leveraging technology. Um, so, and I'm so worried about cell phones being a target and being taken away if that's like a main means of communication. So I'm just wondering if you, if you can talk any little bit about that. Taking the phones from people. Oh, the, the, these are, groups that have been trained just for terrorizing the people. And when they steal these phones, it turned out people were expecting, you know, people to be arrested according to what in the uh, phones. Most of the time, they don't end up in the hands of the militia leaders or the government, the military that is there. They end up Within three days, they will be in Chad or in Niger to be sold there. So they are money makers for the people who are taking them. Uh, so, and, and also, uh, people have learned a few things of like having two phones one for taking pictures while you're out, and one that has your material that's staying home. So they are trying to. To do that, if you can, and, and sometimes we send we send them phones that are like uh, two hundred dollars phones now, or a hundred and fifty dollar phone. You could send one of those and have them take it out and leave their expensive iPhone or whatever at home. Um, um, so the the, strat the 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 tactics they have the same strategy, but the tactics are changing daily, sometimes twice in a day what people should do with it on, on the streets. Excellent. Um, we have until one o'clock, is that right? Yeah, that's about have, one o'clock now. We're almost there. Any other questions? If not, I'll sneak one in. But anybody else first? Okay, it's my turn. Uh, just really quickly, you're an activist and you're a researcher at the same time. And I think oftentimes we look at those two roles as being somewhat tenuous. There's some conflict between the two, but I'm also thinking there can be some advantages to being an activist and being a researcher at the same time. Do you have any insights on how maybe activism enhances your research or how being a researcher makes you a more effective activist? Well, it's it is interchangeable. <laughs> they 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 mix, they cross each other. Uh, because I think for for some time, um, uh, research is for those calm professors uh, sitting somewhere, writing, reading, not participating in whatever the riffraff is doing. Uh, now it is changing. 
Because sometimes when you are there doing this firsthand, listening to the people, reading about what's going on, getting yourself in the mix, it is more advantageous when you do the research. Then because you are not waiting for other people to come and talk to you. You have already done that while you are doing your activism. And then you can sit down and do your research. Or, or, and, and, and it becomes, it used to be, um, if you are a demonstration goer, then you are not a good researcher or you are not a good professor. Now the, the thing is changing. If you don't participate now, when are you going to participate? What use is your research? If it is not benefiting the people now, do you want just a book on a shelf? Anyone can do that, right? But then if when you are an activist and a researcher at the same time, uh, it is more advantageous to say. Except that, for example, there are uh, many Sudanists who would come to the Sudan, but then they are, they are restricted. They can't go into the demonstrations because the government of the country, the UK or the US, doesn't want to be involved in these uh, incidents. So they find themselves a little bit restricted. Just as I was restricted from traveling uh, on, uh, on, uh, on an American uh, uh, Fulbright. You cannot do that. But when you go without those restrictions, then you can do it. You can go and mingle with the people and see what is going on and participate in, in any way you can. Just the, the virtual meetings like this one, we will go in like 100 people will be there. And they will have some of these meetings sometimes go on for like four hours. Because that's a chance to talk to the people who were in there and it's a chance when you go there you will meet them and they will show you the group that did this and did that and uh, so that's it's a huge advantage for a researcher to be an activist I, that was so well said yeah. Ellie, yeah, go ahead so well said. i was just gonna say that is a great sort of line to end on i think because i think it really touches on why um, your research and you as a researcher are the perfect person to start this series for us this semester about um, what how we do research in times of conflict and how conflict affects our research and i think um, this idea that you can be a researcher and an activist and actually improves you and it proves your work um, is really important and what the heck are we doing if we're just writing books to stay on shelves i think is a really important thing that i i, I want us to hang on to um, and so I just want to sort of formally thank both Dr. Abdel Halim and Dr. Haas for um, presenting and facilitating today's conversation. And I want to remind everyone that this is part of a longer series presented by the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Committee of the College of Arts of Letters. And we have another talk coming up in a couple of weeks with Tasha Dunn from the Communications Department. Um, and she'll be talking about the role of social media in relation to political conflict and political uprising. So I think it will make a really nice transition. Okay. So I wanna encourage everyone to join us and also remind everyone that we're recording today. So I'm gonna find a good place where we can post our Brown Bag series recording so that we can share them much more widely with our colleagues, both here and you know internationally, because I think it's gonna make a great conversation. So stay tuned for that. And with no further ado, we'll Say goodbye and see you all soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.